I was reminded before uh, I got a chance to speak here, watch how I say the word elderly. Please forgive me. I'm right there with you guys, though. I turned 50 this year, okay? There you go. Right on. Amen. Hey, um, maybe you know, maybe you don't, but tonight is the anniversary of Pastor Rich's daughter, Nicole, passing. And so Pastor Rich is with his family, and rightly so, uh, remembering their daughter and I believe ministering to one another and being ministered to by the Lord. And I think it would be right for us uh, to pray for them. As we get ready to study God's word, uh, I'm sure you would agree with me. Watching them walk through this journey this last year. I mean, I love my pastor. He's one of my best friends. But my respect for him went to a whole nother level. And for Jordy. For the whole family. And it's a time for us as a church just to also lift up the prayers of the saints for our pastor to stand with the family. Amen. So we're going to pray for God's blessing over our time in the Word, but I think it would be right for us just to take a moment to lift them up too. Would you join me in praying? Father, we thank you so much for Pastor Rich and for Jordy and Father, the whole family, little Avia and Ethan and, and Chris and and Chelsea, and Victoria, and all the family, Lord, and our family too, the church family. Oh, Lord God, would you meet them tonight as you've met them every day since? May your nearness be so real to them. May the compassion and your comfort be so real. Father, that it's just undeniable. It's unmistakable, Lord. They just know. I pray, Father God, that as they spend time together, you would minister to them and bless them and comfort their hearts, Lord, and wipe away those tears. We thank you, Nicole, is with you. We look forward to that reunion. But Father, until then, bring the comfort that only you can bring. Fill the void that only you can fill. Minister to our pastor and his wife and family. Father God, show yourself strong on their behalf. And Lord, as we get ready to study your word right now, Father, we just don't come haphazardly as a, well, this is the midweek ritual. There's a hunger in our hearts, Lord. That's why we're here Lord, it's so easy to get drained being in the world, and we need that refreshment the middle of the week just to meet with the living God of all creation. But even now, Father, as we get ready to study your word, we recognize that there could be areas of our heart where we're deaf to you, where we're blind to your ways. We might even be calloused or hardened, Lord. And so we pray, Father God, that you would move mightily as we study your word. And, Father, you would see within us hearts that are truly teachable. We need you, Lord. May Christ increase as we decrease. May we truly be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. May the, the power of the cross have its ultimate impact on our lives. We pray right now, Lord, as we study your word, that you would meet us here and cause your word to come alive. Help us to understand it and help us to properly apply it. We pray in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen. Um, title of my message tonight, from Exodus chapter 7, verses 14 through 25, the symptoms of a hard heart. The symptoms of a hard heart. You know, we've entered into a new dispensation in the Dodd home. Our daughter Melina is getting close to being three. And so, quite a while ago, we began the exercise of potty training our daughter. And, and, and at first, we thought we had a jewel here. We have the kind of daughter that's going to make us look good as parents, okay? Because it looked like everything was just dialing in, and I don't know what happened. But all of a sudden, one day, we don't look like good parents anymore. Because our daughter doesn't want to cooperate. Something happened, okay? And so, some people would call it bribery. We call it incentives. We look for ways. <laughs> to, just to encourage our daughter. 
please, no more diapers. Here is your potty, okay? Use the restroom. And so she just continues to resist, and she continues to resist. Honey, we'll give you candy for you when you go to the bathroom on the toilet. Nope, I'm good. Don't need candy. What kind of child is this? <laughs> Definitely not my child. No, she is, but I'm just saying. I love the candy. Just look at me. Anyway, um, my wife, you know, she loves to study. Uh, Melina does. She loves to read. She loves to learn and whatnot. So we thought we'd use school as an incentive. Listen, Melina, in order for you to go to school, you need to be potty trained. You know what my daughter said? She says, it's okay, Mama. I don't want to go to school. I want to stay home with you. Okay? That's what we're dealing with here, you know? Let's have fellowship, Mom, as you're changing my diaper. Okay? Isn't this fun? You know, stubbornness can be funny, even cute when a child is young. Uh, but maybe you'd agree with me, it's not so funny as a child gets older. In fact, um, a person can become so hard, so set in their ways, that their story actually becomes tragic. You, you look at their lives and you begin to wonder, what will it take for this guy or gal to get it? You know, how bad do things have to get before they truly hit rock bottom. You know, tonight we're going to look at, I believe, a very tragic character. Much is made of him in the Bible. Pharaoh of Egypt, about his hard heart. And as we examine his life, we'll discover what those symptoms of a hard heart are. So in the process, we can learn God's way of reversing the diagnosis in our own lives. You know, it's going to be really easy to say, I'm looking at Pharaoh. I'm not as bad as that. But here's the question I want to have in our minds as we're studying this passage. How much hardness of heart is acceptable? Did you hear that? How, how, how hard do we have to be? Just a little bit, is that acceptable? Or does God have a better way? Let's pick up in verse 14 of chapter 7. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is stubborn. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is going out to the water and station yourself to meet him on the bank of the Nile. And you shall take in your hand the staff that was turned into a serpent. And you will say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to you, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. But behold, you have not listened until now. Thus the Lord, says the Lord, By this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will strike the water that is in the Nile, with the staff that is in my hand, and it shall be turned to blood. And the fish that are in the Nile will die, and the Nile will become foul, and the Egyptians will find difficulty in drinking water from the Nile. Then the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their rivers, over their streams, over their pools, and over all their reservoirs of water that they may become blood, and they shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. So Moses and Aaron did even as the Lord had commanded, and he lifted up the staff and struck the water that is in the Nile, in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, and all the water that was in the Nile was turned to blood, and the fish that were in the Nile died, then the Nile became foul, so that the Egyptians could not drink from the Nile. And the blood was through all the land of Egypt. But the magicians of Egypt did the same with their secret arts. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And he did not listen to them, as the Lord had said. Then Pharaoh turned and went into his house with no concern even for this. So all the Egyptians dug around the Nile for water to drink, for they could not drink from the water of the Nile. And seven days passed after the Lord had struck the Nile. In this section in Exodus, we're entering into a new section where God is bringing judgments called plagues upon Egypt. Now, God's purpose behind the plagues is threefold. Number one, 
to reveal himself as the Lord of all creation. As Lord over all creation, that he is without peer. He alone is God. And as a result, that would also reveal, number two, that Egypt's gods were false. They were false gods. And number three, to bring Israel out of Egypt and into the promised land, just as he promised Abraham. Now, if you're taking notes, the first symptom of a hard heart is this. And we find it in verses 14 through 19, pride. Wow, I know that's a real revelation for you. Never would have guessed that, Matt. Pride. Comes back to pride. You see, it's the kind of person who lives their life in such a way where life is all about me. Do you know anyone like this? It's all about me. In fact, the word translated stubborn here literally means heavy, dull, or weighed down because of pride. What is pride? Pride is, is the kind of person who lives their life in such a way where they are the Lord of their life. They reign on the throne, and as a result, there is no room for anyone else but them. I think Psalm 10, verse 4, captures it so well. In his pride, the wicked man does not seek him, God. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. Boy, that captures it so well. Or to put it, you know, in modern day terms, that song by Frank Sinatra, you know it. I did it, what? My way, right? I don't need anyone else. It's all about my way. That's the key. But we need to understand something about God here. God needs to confront the symptoms of a hard heart. So he's going to confront the pride, and that's exactly what he did to Pharaoh through Moses and Aaron. He even demonstrated his superiority over Pharaoh and his magicians with the sign. We see that it's this in verses 8 through 13. Uh, Aaron's staff was thrown to the ground, and before Pharaoh and the magicians, it was turned into a snake. Now, what happened? Well, the magicians and sorcerers did the exact same thing. Their staffs were turned into a snake, right? But what happened? Well, Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Once again, the enemy can try to duplicate, can try to copy, but God always wins. Amen? God wins. But Pharaoh resisted and refused to obey God by letting Israel go because he was weighed down with pride. And here's something to take note of when it comes to pride. Pride is debilitating, not liberating. Did you capture that? It will weigh you down. When a man or a woman is filled with pride, they are weighed down with self. And all sin ultimately flows from pride, from self. I need to reign. It's about glorifying me. It's about gratifying me, you see. So all sin ultimately flows from that kind of heart. All a person who is filled with pride can think about is what? Me, me, me. Right? And, and their three best friends? Me, myself, and I. And, and by the way, don't think the church is free from this. It can infect the church as well. In fact, the Apostle John noted in 3 John, verse 9, something about a man named Diotrephes. I wrote something to the church about Diotrephes. Look at this. Who loves to be first among them and does not accept what we say. Here is a leader in the church, but the guy's so heavy and full of himself that he's actually rejecting the Apostle's teaching. And John says, and when we get there, we're going to deal with this matter. Why? Because the Lord's servant doesn't lord it over others. He or she is a servant to others. Amen? Amen. You know, it's interesting. I came across this story. The late scholar A.T. Robertson, he once wrote an article for a religious publication of his day about Diotrephes, but he changed it up. He changed the name. He updated the story by using kind of modern-day terms. And he actually labeled Diotrephes the church boss. 
what's so funny about this is, is that Robertson found out that later, after the article was published, 20 deacons canceled their subscriptions because they thought the article was a personal attack on them. <laughs> Doesn't that say it all? You know, as a person becomes full of themselves, they become progressively also dull to the things of God. And over time, they also grow, grow blind to the things that God is using to get their attention. You know, God uses people. He uses his word. He uses circumstances. He uses all these things. He's using all of these things. What? To conform us into the image of Jesus Christ. But if we're so full of ourselves, we can't see what God is doing. We can't even hear the warnings that he's issuing out to us. You know, I, I look at Proverbs chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, and all of a sudden I hear the heart of God through this. Listen to this. Does not wisdom call and understanding lift up her voice? On the top of the heights, beside the way, where the paths meet, she takes her stand. You have this idea of, of wisdom calling out the crossroads of life. Let me show you the, the way of wisdom. Let me show you the way of the Lord. And it begs the question, why does God cry out? Why does God want you and I to know? Why does he want us to know that where we're standing is in a dangerous place and there is no good that can come from pride? Listen to his heart for the wicked. Ezekiel 33, 11. As I live, declares the Lord God, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from his way and live. Can you hear the heart of the Lord? Turn back. Turn back from your evil ways. God is saying, get rid of the pride, man. Get rid of the pride, woman. Your heart is hard. I'm warning you. The way that you are going is a broad path to destruction, but I have a narrow path that leads to life. Jonah, he didn't want to go to Nineveh. The Ninevites were a wicked people. He went the opposite direction the moment God called him. Finally, after he gets swallowed up by the big fish and spit out on the shore, he said, okay, I think I'll go now. He proclaims repentance to the Ninevites, and the people repent, and he is ticked off. He is angry with God because he knew if they repented, God would have mercy on them. Listen to God's heart once again, Jonah 4.11. And, and should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and left hand? Why are you and I here tonight? Because God has compassion on his enemies. Because that's what we were. But at the right time, Christ died for you and for me. And now we are recipients of the awesome, loving kindness of our God. Amen? How many of us are thankful for the mercy of God? Amen? Amen. Me too. I'm with you there. But you see, even though God loves his enemies, and God is calling out to his enemies, it's also true that God resists the proud. It's very clear from the word of God. You see, God sent Moses and Aaron to confront Pharaoh at the Nile River, we're told in these verses, in the morning. In Egypt, religious ceremonies were often held at the Nile, and Pharaoh led many of them. In fact, they had this expression, a hymn from the Nile. And listen to these words, because this was their view of the Nile River. Bringer of food, rich in provisions, creator of all good, Lord of majesty, sweet fragrance. I find this really kind of funny. God sent Moses out and Aaron out to confront Pharaoh during his morning devotion time. I just find that kind of comical. He was confronting his paradigm on life. He was basically letting Pharaoh know life is not all about you, Pharaoh. And the gods of Egypt are useless. Let me show you a better way because pride is not it. You see, life is not all about me. 
Life is all about God. Amen? Life is all about God. I'm reminded of a story. One of our pastors, Pastor Keith Hamilton, he, uh, years ago, was asked to do a wedding. And so he was doing the premarital counseling and whatnot. Uh, but, but the bride, and I'm putting it kindly, was a bridezilla. Have you ever heard of a bridezilla before? Oh, my word. It, it was bad, guys. It was bad. Keith is one of the most patient, kind individuals. Straight shooter, but I tell you, one of the most patient, kind men you'll ever see. And this gal was making it all about her. Finally, he sat down with her one night, and, and the groom is there, and she's there, and he said, I need to let you know right now, this wedding, it is not all about you. That's a good word, huh? Huh? This wedding is about God and what this marriage represents, the union of Christ and his church. It is not all about you. And we need to see that as well. Because sometimes when life hits us with all these different things, we think life is all about me. We pray, God, I want your kingdom come and your will be done. But when it's not my way, we get ticked off and hacked at God, right? God, why aren't you signing off on what I told you to do? Because it's not all about you, buddy. It's all about God. You see, God is the only source of true blessing. The Egyptians thought it was the Nile River. But James 1.17 says, Every good thing bestowed and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting of shadows. Are you blessed? Then your blessing comes from our Father in heaven. Amen. He is the source of blessing. Not your 401k, not Obamacare, not Oprah Winfrey, okay? None of the Republican candidates or Democratic candidates. It's all about Jesus Christ. That's the source of our blessing. That's the source of our hope, amen? And if you don't like what I said, send your email to Pastor Rich at rich at calvaryhillsboro.org. All things were also created by him and for him. Colossians 1.16, for by him, meaning Christ, all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. Look at this. All things have been created by him and for him because it's all about him. Why are we here? For him. What's my life about? To bring glory to him. You see, it's all about him. And God blesses the humble. You know, I mentioned this a moment ago. God is opposed to the proud. It comes from James 4, 6. But look at the second part of the verse. God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. It's interesting. That word opposed means to range in battle against. There is this intensity of opposition if you walk in pride. Conversely, if you are humble, that is the place of blessing. How many of us tonight want to remain in that place of blessing? Then let us cry out to the Lord, search my heart and see if there be any hurtful way in me. Remove all that pride, Lord, because I don't want to tolerate any hardness in my heart whatsoever. The second symptom of pride Number two, which really flows from this idea of, of a hard heart, is, is stubbornness. We see this in verses 20 and 22. And this idea of stubbornness, which, which makes sense. If I'm filled with pride, if life is all about me, then my way is the best way. Right? Everyone else is wrong, and I'm right. I wish you guys would get on the right bandwagon here, which is mine, because my way is the right way. Okay? And if you don't like it, you can find the highway, right? It's all about me. It's all about my way, you see. And the sight of Pharaoh and his servants, look at this. The Nile River. The powerful, mighty Nile River, which turned a desert in North Africa. All along that stretch, vibrant vegetation and life, Right? It was turned to blood, according to verse 20. The result, the fish died, their source of food. The drinking water was tainted, and that sweet-smelling Nile wasn't smelling so sweet anymore. 
And all the vessels, by the way, it appears, the vessels of stone, the vessels of wood, even things throughout the rest of the kingdom, they were turned. Anything holding water was turned to blood as well. There was nowhere to escape, okay? The fish were dying to get out, okay? That was a joke. Fish dying to get out. Wow, rough crowd here, guys. Come on. I'm sensing some hardness here, some symptoms. You know, I remember one time years ago, I was, uh, went to a, a river here in Oregon, and it was a hot summer day, and I jumped on into the river and just was refreshed, having a great time, just having a great time. There's no smell to the river. Everything is just great and, and wonderful. I get out of the river, and all of a sudden, I see this news report that the river that I'm swimming in is a contaminated river, contaminated with, yeah, you know what? Oh, that was so bad. You know, no matter how much I washed and showered, you know, it just felt dirty still. You know what I'm talking about? But I could still get away. Eventually, whatever got on me because I was in the river came off, and I felt better about myself, you know? Though I checked news reports before I ever jumped into a river again, I'll tell you that much. In Egypt here, there was no place to run. They were surrounded God was sending a message to those stubborn hearts. You see, the Egyptians worshipped gods associated with the Nile. Isis, for instance, was the goddess of the Nile. But this is really key. Osiris was the god of the underworld. But get this. The Egyptians believed the Nile was his bloodstream. So think about this for a moment. When the Nile was changed to blood... What would a devout worshiper of Osiris think? God was sending a message. Your gods are not gods at all. Amen? Very, very powerful here. But what did Pharaoh do? You see the hardness of his heart here. How stubborn he was. He called in the magicians and they copied what Moses and Aaron did. Now, more than likely because the water was already turned to blood, they had to filter it out and then turn it back into blood again. But I'm thinking, hey, guys, if you really want to figure this thing out, don't make more blood. Turn it into clean water. But that tells you just how foolish the heart is, that they would make matters worse rather than making things better, just like our government. Moving on. Anyway, I'm just having fun, just seeing if you're listening. That's all. Yeah, rich at calvaryhillsboro.org. That's right. You guys are with me. You see, Pharaoh's heart was hardened according to verse 22, which means it was strong, rigid, and firm. This idea that I get from this is that he was set in his ways. He was stubborn and unwilling to move even though it may cost him everything. Have you ever been unwilling to move? Unwilling to budge? Stubborn? Or unteachable? You know, when I was growing up, my parents when we did things wrong, would spank us. I really never got spanked because I was a perfect child. But my siblings, okay, I got spanked once or twice. But anyway, I'll never forget. <laughs> my, my sister Mindy, she's just a little bit younger than me because uh, I'm the oldest of four. And she uh, was being told by my dad as he's getting ready to spank her, I'm doing this because I love you, Mindy. And my little sister turned around and said, Dad, I wish you didn't love me so much. You're hoping for a teachable moment as a parent. But even when you're caught red-handed, right? I still have to hold on to my stubbornness. I have to hold on to my pride. And you know, you see that in people when they're confronted. It's just the way I am, they'll tell you. You know, even Christians, and, and they'll use a religious angle. God made me this way. Well, hey, don't blame God for the mess that you have there. Don't blame God for your pride and your stubbornness. But, you know, it gets worse. People can get so set in their way, so entrenched, that they'll even say things like, if you don't like it, then you can leave. How many churches have been divided because of that? How many marriages and families have been torn apart because we're so concerned about maintaining our pride, being right in our own eyes, 
that we're willing to let those relationships die and help them do so. How tragic. How tragic. It's amazing how stubborn the human heart can be. We're not going to turn there, but in, in Luke 19, verses 37 through 40, we are told of Jesus and the triumphal, triumphant entry of Christ into Jerusalem. When Christ came upon the city, we are told that he began to weep over the city. Why? Because they did not recognize the day of his visitation. You see, if they would have studied Daniel chapter 9, they would have understood that the moment there was a decree given to rebuild Jerusalem, they could count down the time for when Messiah would come. They should have known. God was shouting it out. Why? Because God wanted them to accept their Messiah. But instead, their hearts were so hard, they would not recognize the day of his visitation. He longed to gather them together as a hen gathers her chicks. And at one point, the Pharisees and the religious leaders said, hey, these people who are crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, which was a, a messianic praise. Reserved for Messiah alone. They're declaring, he is the one that we've been waiting for. The Pharisees said, tell them to stop. And Jesus said, if they stop, I tell you the truth. These very rocks will cry out. How amazing that creation, inanimate rocks, recognize Messiah when our hearts can get so hard they refuse to do so. That's how hard a heart can get, stubborn and set in their ways. But we need to see God's way is the best way. You see, I am convinced God's word shares it. God's way brings life and peace. Romans 8, 6, for the mindset on the flesh is death. And all of us know that. That's why we're in this mess after the fall. But the mindset on the spirit is what? Life and peace. How many of us want some more of that in our lives? Then let us set our minds on the things of the Spirit. Lord, take away any hardness of our heart. All the pride and the stubbornness, it needs to go. And we need to also know that God leads, leads us in ways that are righteous. They're the best way. It's the kind of way that makes our hearts sing because it was what we were intended for, a living relationship with the living God, a holy life devoted to the Lord. That is the best life. You see, God is not some type of cosmic killjoy. He wants us to live life and have it to the full, but it's not found in the things that the world has to offer. It's found in Christ alone. Let me tell you, a bottle of alcohol won't take you there. Smoking pot won't take you there. Watching pornography on the internet won't take you there. Having illicit affairs won't take you there. It's found in Jesus Christ alone, you see. Psalm 23, verse 3 says, He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And I'm saying, Lord, that's the path for me. It might be a narrow path, but that's the path for me. Because you know what? There is no regret with righteousness. None whatsoever. But I also want to let you know there are some things to be stubborn about. You know what? If you want to be stubborn, trust God and obey him. Amen? That's something to be stubborn about. How about this? Flee from temptation and pursue righteousness. That's something to be stubborn about, right? How about this one? Pray and study God's word. Oh, Lord, I want to make sure that my life is built around my time with you rather than trying to cram you in when I have a moment. I'm going to be stubborn. I want to love others the way Christ loves us. I'm going to be stubborn. You know what? I'm not going to be silent. I'm going to boast about God. Amen? Why? Because 1 Corinthians 1.31, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Symptoms of a hard heart, pride, stubbornness. The third is this, if you're taking notes, indifference. Indifference. It's that mentality that says, whatever. If you've got teenagers, you know, you've probably heard that before. Whatever. Whatever. Do what you want. It's not my problem. Whatever. Not my problem. Makes no difference to me. I don't care. I don't care. Notice Pharaoh's response, verse 22. He did not listen to them. 
He turned and went into his house with no concern even for this. Verse 23. Even though his subjects, the Egyptians, were struggling for seven days, according to verses 24 and 25. You know, it would have been so easy for Pharaoh to end this, to humble himself, to believe God and to obey God's word, but he refused. He just walked away. God's calling out. You can fix this, Pharaoh. It's in your hands. It reminds me of when I was in Dallas, a very tragic story. I was pastoring down there. And there was a, a family that was going through some very, very difficult times, and marriage was basically falling apart. And I had the husband and wife in my office. And the wife was telling me she was going to leave her husband. And these were my words to her. I beg you in the name of Jesus Christ, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to your husband because she told me I do not have biblical grounds to divorce my husband. I begged her, please come back to the Lord. This is a bad place that you're in. But I'll never forget her response. She looked me dead in the eyes, stood up and walked out of my office. Broke my heart. God blessed the man and his children, but her life just began to fall apart. You see, she wasn't in a place of blessing. Her pride, her stubbornness led to this indifference. I don't care. Let God do what he's going to do. I'm going to walk out the door. Some have even said things like this. Well, God will forgive me anyway. If you know that sin is against the Father heart of God, why would you want to hurt his heart? God will forgive true repentance. But don't do that to the Father heart of God. Amen? You see, some people have to learn the hard way. They're just bent on it. And you wonder, what will it take? Tonight, God's speaking. There's people here tonight, and you may be wondering why I'm even at church tonight, because you don't know Jesus is your Savior. I believe God's calling out to you, and he wants you to come to faith in Jesus Christ. There's others who are here tonight. God's calling out to you, and he said, you've been away from me way too long. Would you come home? I've been waiting for you. I want to bless your life. There are other people who are here tonight, and you know what? Your heart is hard because it's broken. And you've become cynical and hardened to the love of God because you're hurting. And I want you to come and give your heart to the Lord. Say, Lord, I give you this pain. Would you heal my heart? I want it to be soft and moldable again in your hands. God loves you. You see, what God wants from us is that we would pray, God, do whatever you want in me. How many of us want to make that our prayer tonight? God, do whatever you want to do in me. You see, you might not be as hard as Pharaoh was, but hardening happens by degrees. Over time, it will progressively get worse. So I ask you this question tonight. Is life becoming more about you? If it is to any degree, your heart is getting hard. Are, are you getting more set in your ways? But not the right ways. If so, your heart is getting hard. But I even want to call out this. Is there an indifference? Was there a time when you heard someone take the name of the Lord in vain and it shocked you, but now it doesn't matter anymore? Was there a time where R-rated movies were offensive and there's no way that was going to be in your home, but all of a sudden now you're watching it and it doesn't bother you anymore? When people would gossip, you would have to walk away from that conversation because be careful little ears what you hear. You don't want to let that into your heart. Or do you just sit there and now you engage in it and laugh along with the jokes? You see what I'm saying? We can get so indifferent. Oh, that's out there and yet it's in here too. And God wants to do something about it. We need to return to the Lord and let him fix our heart. Going back to Dallas when I was there, 
the church was first getting started and there was a man who started coming to our Bible study and he brought a woman with him. And I began to ask, hey, tell me what's going on? How do you guys know each other? Come to find out, he was single, she was married, and they were having an affair, but they wanted to come to our Bible study. So I took him aside and I said, you know what? God loves you, man, and he wants to bless your life, but I need to let you know, you need to make a choice. Is it God or this woman? I'm telling you right now, he has a blessing for you, but you can't do both. It's either or. It's black or white, you see. You're either hot or you're cold. Don't try to be lukewarm. It's not going to work. But I'm telling you as well, you cannot stay in this church. If you want to come back after you give up this relationship, I will openly receive you back in and bless you and, and, and just stand with you and try to help you out any way I can. But I'm telling you right now, there's no way as our church is getting started here that we're going to tolerate this because we are wholly devoted to the Lord. He left. But I was so blessed a couple of years later when he came through the door on a Sunday morning, broken, and he came to faith in Jesus Christ. He renounced that relationship and began to walk strong in the Lord again. And the same thing can be true for us. By degrees, whatever the degree is, Lord, soften my heart. There's a song that I used to sing back in the day when I was a worship leader in the Four Square Church. Maybe you heard it. It goes something like this. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Join me if you know the words. Melt me, mold me, fill me, fill me, use me, use me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. David said in Psalm 51, verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken spirit and a contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Let's make it our prayer tonight and say, Lord, here's my heart. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time in your word. And, oh, God, we do not want to go the way of Pharaoh. We want to go your way. And so, Lord, we say, here's our heart, Lord. Church, with eyes closed and heads bowed, if, if, if you're saying, Lord, here's my heart, would you just raise your hand? Just declare, Lord, here's my heart. Search it, Lord. If there's any bent of hardness in there, Lord, I want it removed. Here's my heart, Lord. Lord, you see the hands that are raised. I raise mine too. Forgive me, God, for the times my heart has been hard. Renew a right spirit within us, Lord. Revive your church. Here's our hearts, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to continue.